Hi, welcome to another season of the Renew.org Network podcast. It has been a while. COVID has happened, is still happening. We've seen many of you online through our virtual platform, live.renew.org, and then back in person again at our biggest national gathering to date, which was this past November. I want to thank everybody who supports Renew.org and is part of the network. And if you're new, welcome. We're a network of churches, church leaders, and yes, even everyday disciple makers. We all come together and celebrate good biblical theology. My name's Jason. I'm going to kick off our fourth season. I'm going to be introducing some of this series. Later, you'll hear from a new member of our team, Cammie, and she'll help introduce a few in this series. We're going to be playing some of the breakout sessions from the 2021 National Gathering. There were 10 of these in all, so even if you attended live, we're probably going to be playing a few you haven't heard yet. Up first is Rick Atchley speaking on the importance of biblical preaching. But this message is not just for preachers. Rick is a really gifted communicator. He's going to engage anybody with his message on how the Holy Spirit can use you. Now, Rick is a real encouragement. He's a seasoned presenter of the gospel, and he's been in his current role at the Southern Hills Church of Christ in Texas for over 25 years. In that time, Rick has seen the membership double there. And at Renew.org, we're really concerned with healthy, disciple-making churches, and we know it's not always about the numbers and size, but Rick's church is the largest of its kind by a factor of two when compared to the next largest. So it's a metric worth noting. It earns Rick a hearing, and I think this is going to be a breakout presentation worth listening to. Our point leader at Renew.org, Bobby Harrington, is going to introduce him further in this recording. So let's sit back and listen to Rick Ashley on the importance of biblical preaching. So it's uh, my privilege to introduce Rick Atchley to you. I first came to know of Rick as uh, one of the most effective preachers uh, that I'd ever seen, actually, in the early 80s. I was trying to confirm my dates, and Rick said that he's been preaching for 42 years. So Rick is at the Hills Church in Dallas, and uh, when you're preaching for 42 years and you have a legacy, for really effectively preaching the Word of God, and he really preaches the Word of God. The fact that we have guys in here like Donnie Williams and uh, Joe Beam and Buddy Bell, who are great preachers, and they, they want to come and hear Rick Ashley, that may tell you everything <laughs> you need to hear. So, Rick, uh, grateful to have you here. I'd like to lead us in a word of prayer and come up and talk to us about the importance of biblical preaching. Let's pray. God, we commit this time to you. Um, for our churches, preaching the Word of God is absolutely essential. Oh God, help us to be effective at it. Show us through Rick how to maintain and engage in effective biblical preaching. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you you, uh, for coming to this session. I know what it's like to come to sessions right after a lunch on a long day. So uh, I'll do my best to keep you awake, uh, but don't worry, you can't do anything while I'm speaking I haven't seen before, okay? (laughs) I mean nothing, I mean, when I retire, I'm gonna write a book, things I have watched while I was preaching. (laughs) And uh, it will be a pretty long book, so I do get it, I do understand. Uh, I'm so thankful to be here, it's been a great day already, I've been very, very encouraged by the conference and the things I've heard, thank you Bobby. Not just for today, but thank you for your vision for the church making disciples and getting us back to the bullseye. So I I think preaching is a big part of uh, the disciple making process. And I'm going to make my case for that here in just a moment. Um, So we have three children. Uh, We uh, had a season of infertility and wound up adopting a son and later adopting a a daughter, and then many years later, my wife pulled the Sarah thing and get, bore me a son in her old age. And so we have three children. Now, all of you that preach know this. Um, in some ways, your wife is a single mom on Sunday mornings. Uh, I've only preached two churches. I preached for 11 years at a church in Abilene, Texas called Southern Hills. And then for the last 32 years, I preached for a church in the Fort Worth area called the Hills Church. And so the two churches I preached at have always had multiple services. Now here's what that means. I've never gone to church on Sunday morning with my family. I'm always up before they're up. I'm always home after they're home. 
So my wife, all those years, had to get our children up, get them dressed, get them to church, and basically take care of them during the assemblies because I'm off doing my thing. And some of you ladies know what that is like. And so like you, my wife came up with strategies to manage as best she could when Michael and Morgan were uh, in those very young years. And her basic strategy was, I'm going to candy them to death, okay? <laughs> now, I don't know what your particular position is on eating in a church building, but no matter where you're from, we all know if you're under two, you can eat anything you want, anytime you want. So my wife would pack the Cheerios and the gummy bears or whatever it was, and here was her uh, strategy, is that we're not going to have the candy until Daddy starts to preach. Okay, we can get them through the song service, maybe even through the communion service, and then when Daddy starts to preach, they've had all they can handle, and we got to start giving them the candy. So my daughter is about two years old, and she starts in early on. I want some candy, not till Daddy preaches. I want some candy, not till Daddy preaches. So we have the song service. We're having the communion service. There's a spirit of reverence all through the sanctuary. And suddenly you hear this little voice, Preach, Daddy! Preach! And everybody goes, Oh, what a godly child. No, she just wanted her candy. And it raises the question, Why should anybody want me to preach? Or for that matter, Why do I, after all these years, still want to to preach and please know that I'm exploring the question with you more as a peer than as a mentor uh, even though I have been doing this a long time I still have much to learn about preaching I don't teach on preaching nearly as much as I go places where I can learn how to be a better preacher if I bring one thing to the table I bring this I've been in the trenches a long time not only have I been in the trenches a long time, but I am still, uh, I'm still running to the finish line with passion. Okay? I'm not coasting. I'm not preaching sermons I preached 20 years ago and just drawing a check. I believe as much as I ever have in the power of preaching to move the people of God deeper into the kingdom of God. So... Here's what I'm going to do. I don't know how long this will go. I don't think it'll go very long. I'll give you some time perhaps to have a break. But I want to share with you reasons why I believe biblical preaching matters as much as it ever has. I'm going to share with you three theological reasons. And then I'm going to share with you four pastoral reasons. But let's begin first by just doing some theology. Okay, here's the reason number one why I think preaching matters. God calls people to preach. And gives them a message to bring. That's reason number one. Do we have that on the slide, please? God calls people to preach. And He gives them a message to bring. I don't believe preaching is sustainable as a career. If preaching is just a job, you cannot do it as long as I've done it. And do it with passion. Preaching is not a career. It is ultimately a calling. And God does call. One of my preaching peers is in uh, California. And his name is Gene Apple. Some of you know Gene. And you may know that when he was 14 years old on vacation in Minnesota with his family, his father, who was a gospel preacher, died suddenly of a heart attack. And Gene will tell you it was that very day where the Holy Spirit impressed upon him very clearly this word, I'm going to use your life to prepare people to get ready for this day. That's the day he got his call. Ten days later, he preached his first sermon, sharing Christ with others. My call wasn't perhaps quite as dramatic, but I was called. Um, I did not grow up in a Christian environment. Uh, my parents were not church-going people. I don't know if my mother had ever gone to church. She grew up in the home of an alcoholic. My maternal, no, my, my paternal grandmother was the only Christian on either side of my family. Now, I did grow up hearing the name God and Jesus. My grandfather used them all the time, but he wasn't preaching. And so, as you could imagine, my parents had a lot of issues. And I remember a lot of screaming and a lot of fighting. And then suddenly I remember one day my getting in the car with my mom 
and my brother, and we left Illinois where we lived at the time and drove to Texas and left my dad. And I lived a year of my life without my father in my life. And to their credit, and I can't thank them enough, my parents, this is back in the 60s, sought counsel, Christian and non-Christian counsel, and they got the same word from everybody. I don't think they'd get that word today. I'm not sure. I know they wouldn't get it in the second world. I'm not even sure they'd get it in the church. But what they got back in the 60s was, you need to fight for your marriage for the sake of your boys. Your boys need the mother and the father to stay together. Today, I think what they hear most places is, you've got to do what you've got to do to be happy. You've got to do you. Kids are resilient. They'll be okay. But that's not what they heard. So my mother and my father got a rent house in Dallas, Texas, because they weren't sure if this thing was going to work. And they got us as a family back together, and they made a decision. We're going to start going to church. And we went to church. We were that family. We were there on Sunday morning. We were there on Sunday night. Google it. There was such a thing as church on Sunday night. We were there on Wednesday night. Anybody remember week-long gospel meetings? We would go every night to the week-long gospel meeting. Except Thursday. That was their bowl of But the point was... <laughs> I went from no church to church was a huge part of my life from second grade on. And it was somewhere about that time I announced to the world I was going to be a preacher. Now how do you explain that? It wasn't because of brother so-and-so because I didn't know a brother so-and-so. It wasn't because of my godly parents and grandparents. It wasn't because of my experience in the church. I have no way to explain it except I was called. I didn't go through an astronaut stage. I didn't go through, I want to be a Dallas Cowboy stage. And back then they were good. I announced to the world, I'm going to be a preacher. Now, you know those guys out there. And it's just become a job. And it's no longer a call. God calls people to preach. And He gives them a message to bring. Listen to Amos chapter 7. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. You hear what Amaziah is saying? You go make your money somewhere else. This is my turf. This is where I work. This is where I get paid. You go do your preaching somewhere else. Listen to Amos' response. He answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. Amos' passion wasn't to get paid. His passion was to get heard. He spoke for one reason. He had been spoken to. We don't just speak for God. We speak from God. Preaching will cease to matter when we believe God has ceased giving a message to His servants. And that's one of the reasons I have loved some things I have heard today. Because I don't want us to lose the notion of standing before our people having a word from the Lord. Remember, Jesus didn't just give His church scripture. It says in Ephesians 4, He gave His church prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Paul told young Timothy, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift. And he also said in the next letter, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing in His kingdom, I give you this charge, preach the Word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction preach the word in the presence of God and Christ Jesus that should convict you to your toes do we bring to the business of preaching the awe that it deserves that we've been charged by heaven in the presence of God 
and Christ Jesus to feed his flock with the Holy Word. I get a lot of letters over the years. I don't keep many. I kept this one. It was from a fellow that actually at one time had been a preacher. And he wrote me and said, You know, I've bragged on you a bunch. I think you're a great preacher. But there's a particular thing about your preaching that stands out to me. It's a bit unique. You're a great sermon crafter, but that's not it. You're an excellent, powerful presenter, but that's not what's special about your preaching to me. What's really extraordinary about your preaching is the authority with which you assume your role. You preach clearly out of a divine appointment, not just as a staff member. You are confident that God gives you messages and a pulpit and a church to preach to. You've commanded a realization from the church that you have something to say to us and you have a way of calling us to listen to you. Now, he has way, way overestimated my gifts. But I hope he's right about this one thing. I don't stand up on Sunday because I have a job and I need a check. I don't stand up on Sunday because I took a course in communication. I know how to write talks. I stand up to bring a message from the Lord. Why does preaching matter? Because God calls people to preach. And He gives them a message to bring. Here's the second theological reason I believe in preaching. Jesus made preaching a priority in His mission. Did you know the most popular name for Jesus in the Gospels is Teacher. That's what he was called more than anything else. He had a high view of the essentiality of publicly proclaiming the word of the Lord. In Mark 1, you'll remember, the disciples came to him and asked him to come back to the village where a revival was breaking out. He said, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. I have come to preach. Though he was not accredited by the religious establishment, the multitudes would travel great distances at great cost just to hear him preach. Even his critics acknowledge the power of his teaching. There's that humorous story in John chapter 7 where the, the temple rulers send the temple police to go and arrest Jesus. You remember that? And then later in the chapter, they come back with no Jesus. Why didn't you arrest him? We've never heard a dude preach like him before. <laughs> go read it for yourself. Have you heard this guy teach? How can you arrest a man that preaches the way he preaches? So I know I'm weird in this respect. I get that. But if you could pick a day in the life of Jesus... Which day would you pick to personally witness? Would you pick the day that he raised Lazarus from the dead? Would you pick the day he fed the thousands? I get all that. You know what I would do? I would pick a day where I could just sit in the grass for hours and listen to him preach. That's the day I'd pick. I'd rather hear him preach than watch him do a miracle. Jesus was a master preacher. He was absolutely brilliant at illustrations. Whether he was using nature or current events or the scriptures themselves. How he could take life and all that was around and draw spiritual truth. He was brilliant at so what? The importance of application. He didn't just give a homily on the principle of generosity. He got real. You got two coats. You know somebody doesn't have a coat. So why do you still have two coats? <laughs> give him your extra coat. And he would do things like that all the time. Do not judge. Love your enemies. Do not worry. Seek ye first. Pray like this. Do unto others. He was brilliant at taking the highest theological truth and he could put it down on the lowest branch so that anybody could apply the Word of God to their current life situation. And Jesus taught with authority. Eighty times he said, truly, truly. In other words, 
Sit up, boys. I'm about to lay some heavy duty truths on you. Twenty times he said, you have heard it said, but I say. Jesus preached. And he discipled others to preach. He told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Perhaps that explains, for example, you get to Acts chapter 6 and this growing church begins to have some administrative problems when it comes to caring particularly for the widows who weren't fluent in Hebrew. So we got to come up with a plan. And you notice what the apostles did. They didn't say it was unspiritual work. They said, this is important work. We need men filled with the Holy Spirit to address this problem and make sure all the widows get fed. But they said, it's not for us. We must stay devoted to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Where did they get the idea that that was their fundamental priority? Where did they get the idea that the preeminent job of the leaders of this church were to pray and teach the Word? They got it from Jesus because He was their disciple and mentor. So, what have we learned? God calls people to preach. He gives them a word to bring. Jesus made preaching a priority in His mission. And I would argue the entire Godhead held that high view. So the third thing, the Holy Spirit equips and anoints preachers and preaching. That's point number three. Put that up, please. The Holy Spirit equips and anoints preachers and preaching. There is a mystery to the task of preaching that we will never fathom or control. We all know it is possible to prepare a well-crafted sermon and yet not present a word from the Lord. And so, back to Amos. After Amaziah said, you stop preaching on my turf, go get your money somewhere else. The next chapter, Amos predicts a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Now notice, he didn't say Amaziah was going to go out of business. Amaziah was still preaching. His church was still full. But Amos said, there is no word of the Lord in that church. The man of God needs the Spirit of God if the people of God are to hear the word of God. Somebody needs to tweet that. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> The man of God needs the Spirit of God if the people of God are to hear the Word of God. So Paul said to the Corinthians, When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. And it is in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that the message transcends the frailties of the messenger. And all of us that preach understand what I just said. Every Sunday when I walk up the steps to the place where I'm going to go to preach in my church, I pray the same prayer. God, all I've got is a loaves and fishes. And there's a lot of people here who are hungry. You are going to have to multiply this message. You're going to have to take what I have got. And I'm going to give you everything I've got, but it's not enough. And you're going to have to do a miracle in the next 30 minutes. You're going to have to anoint the preaching of your word. And by the way, this is why we preachers are notoriously poor predictors of the impact of our own sermons. Because we cannot measure the anointing. Okay? So you know what I mean 
when I say there are those weeks where we preach and it wasn't good. You know it. Now, now people told you, nice sermon, Pastor, and your wife said, honey, it wasn't that bad. But you know, and I know, it's a pretty sucky sermon. Okay? You know if the church down the road asks you to guest preach, you're not taking that sermon. Okay? You're feeling bad about it. And then someone walks up to you, and they have tears coming down their face, and they say, you will never know how that sermon blessed me. And I'm thinking, you're right. I will never know how that sermon blessed you. Except for the anointing. And so, several years ago, I was preparing my church uh, for a big missions offering by preaching some messages out of the book of Jonah. And the first message was pretty simple. What's your Nineveh? Where's the place or where's the person where you just don't want to go? What's your Nineveh? And I'm standing it out in the foyer area afterwards and an older man comes up to me, probably in his 80s, sweet, quiet man. He's got tears coming down his face. And he shared with me in that moment that his granddaughter was engaged to an African-American man. It would be a biracial marriage. And he had refused to give her his blessing. And that day, the Holy Spirit broke him. And he repented and went immediately to his granddaughter and gave his blessing and confessed his sin the Holy Spirit identified his Nineveh. And here's the thing. As I prepared that sermon, it never dawned on me that that might be a possible application of that sermon. That was the Holy Spirit's conviction, not my wisdom, that stepped into that moment. A while back, I did a sermon on anger. I got an email a few weeks later from a man in another city uh, far away that listens to my sermons each week online. He said, uh, thanks for that sermon on anger. He said, I went on a business trip. I was away from my wife for the longest amount of time in our 18 years of marriage. And when I got home that night, she didn't want to have sex. And I remembered your sermon and I didn't get mad. Now I have to confess when I wrote that sermon <laughs> it never dawned on me that that could be a possible application but the Holy Spirit anoints His Word so what have I said so far I've said that preaching has a Trinitarian shape it is the Word of God about Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I think I could stop right now and make a case why preaching matters. There are profound and robust theological reasons to lift up preachers and preaching. But I want to turn now and I want to share with you some pastoral reflections that have led me to the same conclusion. 43 years in the trenches, feeding churches, what I understand now about preaching and what preaching can do that I did not understand when I first got into this holy calling. Here's pastoral reason number one. People need more than conversations. They need conclusions. Okay, let me unpack that for a moment. I realize now that I preach to a generation who is absolutely certain that the worst thing you can be is certain. <laughs> Doubt is appreciated. Ambiguity is celebrated. Okay, let's just get honest. This is not all bad. There's some of this or some about this that needs to be affirmed. The Bible is an amazing book full of mystery. We are trying to discern the infinite God. There will always be some tension there and some uncertainty 
there. And there will always be a need for tremendous humility on the part of those who claim to speak for God. I can tell you that from the time I started preaching to now, my own list of non-negotiables has gotten a lot shorter. But, I still have a list. Several years ago, I had lunch uh, at the request of a very, very well-known seminary professor in this country. If I said his name, a lot of you would know who he is. He is brilliant. He is scholarly. He is respected across the country in seminaries. And in the course of our conversation, I asked what I thought was a simple question. What do you believe about the bodily resurrection of Jesus? It took him about 15 minutes to answer that question. For the record, it would take me about five seconds. And after 15 minutes, basically, what he said was, that is a really great question. And it's one in which we need to continue to have robust conversation. Let me be clear. Have we reached a point where any topic is open for conversation as long as you claim you have a high view of Scripture? Are we replacing thus saith the Lord with a sharing model where everyone says, well, this is what it means to me. This is my truth. I was deeply impacted as a young preacher by some of the writings of John R. W. Stott. And here's a word I've never forgotten. He says, we have devised ways of reading the Word of God from which no Word of God ever comes. Let me say that again. Because it's never been more true than it is right now. I'm having so many conversations with people with a high view of Scripture who have found a way to read the Word of God for which you can never derive a word from God. Some years ago, the following was found among graffiti on the wall at St. John's University. And Jesus said unto them, Who do you say that I am? And they replied, You are the eschatological manifestation of the ground of our being, the charisma in which we find the ultimate meaning of our interpersonal relationship. And Jesus said, what? <laughs> now I place a high value on robust conversations. I'm not afraid of questions. We need to welcome questions. But I'm of the firm conviction that if we're going to grow disciples, we need to do, give them some rock to stand on. Yeah. Not just sand. The people we pastor need and I would say want us to fasten some things down. Like for example the uniqueness of Jesus. Are we clear that we believe He is the way, the truth, and the life and that no one comes to the Father through Him except through Him? Do we preach clearly that we believe in His sufficiency, in His deity, in His complete uniqueness? The veracity of the resurrection. Are we clear about this? That if he did not physically and bodily come back from the dead, we are wasting our time. How about God's intent for our sexuality? So, there are eight vice lists in the New Testament. Every one of them mentions sexual immorality. In the Revelation, those who are sexually immoral are cast into a lake of fire. Two churches, Pergamon and Thyatira, are specifically called out by Jesus for allowing teaching that encourages sexual immorality. Paul says to the Thessalonian church, it is God's will that you be sanctified. That you avoid sexual immorality. And that you control your body. 
and not give in to lust like the pagans. He goes on to say, God will punish all those who commit these sins as we have warned you. For God hasn't called us to be impure, but to be pure. Therefore, anyone who rejects this teaching is not rejecting man, but rejecting God who gave you His Holy Spirit. Right. Now, in view of all that, if someone comes up to us and says, what is sexual immorality? And they get fogged in the pulpit. We are guilty of pastoral malpractice. What about the sanctity of life? Are we clear in and out of the womb that every life matters to God? In a world of full of divergent opinions, the preacher must sometimes say with boldness. I know there's a lot of different ideas out there about that topic, but we're people who follow Jesus Christ. And because we follow Jesus Christ, we think like this about that. And it can get you in a lot of trouble. Shortly after the phrase Black Lives Matter appeared, five police officers in my city were murdered by an angry person. I was on sabbatical, but I knew I had to come back and talk to my church. So I taped a message, and I was very, very clear that we are going to honor the brave men and women who wear the badge. At the same time, I said it loud, and I went out, I'll say it again, Black Lives Matter. That the people in my church, my people of color, who say Black Lives Matter aren't saying they matter more. They're saying they matter as much. And that's where we're going to stand as a church. We are going to affirm and we are going to give value to all people. We're going to welcome all races. We're going to be very, very, very clear. Because we're Jesus followers. And that's where we stand. And I think more than ever, it's becoming critical that we teach our people to think Christianly. Because the reality is, if we don't catechize them, culture will. And they're getting catechized by culture in ways that are very, very, very unchristian. Why does preaching matter pastorally? Because people need more of the conversations. They need some conclusions. Scripture speaks of proclaiming, warning, Inviting, it doesn't say much about musing. It matters that the sheep know what is sand and what is rock. Pastoral reason number two. People need more than relevance. They need to remember. Early on in my preaching career, I remember a woman came up to me. And she said, and I was in my early 20s, she said, you're never going to say anything I don't already know. Everything you could possibly preach, I've probably heard. You're not going to teach me anything. And probably because I was young and scared, I probably apologized. I know exactly now what I would say to her. I would say to her, sister, it's not my job to teach you what you don't know. It's my job to remind you of what you do know so she'll live it better. That's my job. It's to help people remember what they already know and why it's so important. 1 Corinthians 15. I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. Which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel you're saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. And here's what I've learned after 43 years of preaching. Saved people need the gospel as much as lost people do. You never ever reach a point where people don't need to go deep into the gospel. We must constantly challenge the popular narratives of culture by reminding our people of our own story. So let me caution the younger preachers in this room to be wary of the temptation to novelty. The old story is still good news. Amen. And there is no topic of significance that you cannot address through the lens of the death and the resurrection of Jesus right. and the coming of the kingdom of God. You don't, you don't want to talk about sexuality? Go to 1 Corinthians 6. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. 
You want to talk about race? Go to Ephesians 2. The cross of Christ has torn down the wall of hostility. You want to talk about marriage? Go to Ephesians 5. Love your wives like Christ loved the church and died for her. There's nothing important you can't talk about. You can't do it through the lens of the gospel. We don't need to prepare a gospel that our people will want. We need to prepare our people to want the gospel. And all the implications of it. Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. By the way, that's why one reason, and you can you can take a different view. I know a lot of preaching professors, they hate it when you get in the Old Testament and the preacher winds up talking about Jesus, but I'm of a different opinion. One reason, because when Jesus went to the Old Testament, he wound up talking about himself. Okay? I agree with Tim Keller in his book on preaching. Wherever we go in the Bible, Jesus is the main subject. And one of my convictions at our church is you don't come to a service in my church and we don't have a gospel moment. If it's not in my sermon, it's going to be at the communion meditation. If it's not in the communion meditation, it's going to be at a call to the altar. But you don't come and visit my church for one time and you don't have a moment where you're not confronted with the gospel. They don't need relevance. They need to remember the story that is better than any other story that's being peddled out there. Amen. Preaching matters because people need help remembering what matters. All right, pastoral reason number three. Moving right along, I'm going to get you out in time. People need more than learning. They need leading. Some years ago, one of my, uh, one young men I mentored in ministry wrote me and asked me for some thoughts on preaching. And here's one of the paragraphs. There's so much more to say, but the final thing I want to emphasize is the importance of leading through preaching. I did not understand this as a young preacher. I thought a church would do well if I just crafted good sermons every week. A church will be happy with that, but it will not reach its full potential without bold, spirit-filled leadership. The pastor-teacher has the responsibility to paint God's intended future for His people and inspire them to pursue that future with joy and sacrifice. I'm not talking about being a salesman. I'm talking about being a shepherd who understands that he must constantly be taking his sheep to new pastures for their own well-being. So let me unpack that for just a moment. When I was a young preacher, I thought if I just craft a good sermon and live a life of integrity, my church will be healthy. No, my church will be happy and they'll pat me on the back and give me a cost of living raise. And if you live in a growing suburb where a lot of people in your denomination are moving, your church might even grow. Those days are over. A church must be prayerfully, spiritually led. I expect some pushback. It's going to go something like, we don't need the church to be a business. Jesus talked about following, not about leading. And then typically, you get all the horror stories that I totally acknowledge of all the failed churches out there because some autocrat got up and led dictatorially and it imploded the whole church. And I acknowledge every one of those stories. What you ought to be fair and admit is there's thousands of churches out there absolutely stagnant and dying because they have no vision and no mission and nothing to do except try not to get smaller next week. Yes, sir. Is the solution to bad leadership no leadership? A church without a picture of a desired future is like a cruise ship with no destination. You know what I mean here? You're on the ship. Where is we going? Well, I don't know, but have you seen the buffet? The buffet is awesome. Okay, but where are we going? Have you been to the pool yet? The pool is amazing. We've got churches, and we've got all our programs, we have all our cool little things, but at some point, if people don't know where we're going, they're going to want off the ship. I believe 
preaching that leads protects the church from the virus of consumerism. Perhaps one of the blessings of COVID has been the, the pruning of the church of so many that are primarily in church to consume. You know what I mean. We've all gotten a phone call. We're looking for a new church and wonder what you have to offer us. How many of us get the phone call, we've moved to your area and we have this set of spiritual gifts, so you need them at your church. And so more and more when I get that call, what I do is say, this is who we are as a church and this is what we're trying to accomplish for God. We've got this agenda and these goals and these huge audacious asks of God. You want to come help us do that? And by the way, leading through preaching is individual as well as communal. When you write a sermon, aren't you wanting somehow to move people? Moving people from one place to a better place is leading. And so pastorally, I believe preaching matters because it gives the church and it gives the Christ follower the sense of the picture of this is where I need to be going. And sheep that do not intentionally move will inevitably wander. And then finally, a fourth pastoral reason why preaching matters. People need more than help. They need help. Some things just can't be fixed by a sermon. You know what I mean. You've preached your heart out. Someone walks up to you. You see tears in her eyes. And you know that nothing you said changes the hell they're about to go back to. But they're going back to that hell changed. Preaching reorients by proclaiming the world that the gospel is calling into being. And it keeps people afloat because it tethers them to this anchor called hope. And there are people in our pews week after week after week and they need a big, giant helping of hope. Because the world they're living in is sucking them dry. They need to be told why they they need to hang in. They need to be told why they don't need to give up. Hope tanks leak. And regular preaching keeps them filled. Some years ago, my mother, who came to Christ again when I was a young boy, began having pain in her abdomen. And so she went to several doctors and they couldn't seem to find the medicine that would make it better. And so a doctor finally said after some months, he wanted to do exploratory surgery. So I met my father and my brother at a hospital in Plano, Texas, and the doctor said the surgery will take about two hours. They took my mother back and the doctor came out in 30 minutes. And I have gone to enough hospitals to know what that meant. So he told my father, we're sorry. But we opened Helen up and she's full of cancer. And there was nothing we could do, so we closed her back up. So mom was in post-op. Myself, my brother, my father go in. And she started to come too. And I look over to my father. And he's got tears coming down his face. It's the second time in my life I've seen my father cry. And I realized he can't tell her. So I went beside my mom in the bed and I grabbed her hand. I said, Mom, we didn't get the news we wanted. You've got cancer. The 
doctor says it's bad. The doctor says you're in for a very hard fight. She said, I can do that. And then she squeezed my hand and she said, you know, son, either way, I win. My mother grew up with no knowledge of the world. She grew up with a father that was an alcoholic. She grew up a hard, tough life. I watched my mother in my lifetime become a courageous, faithful, godly woman. And she did put up a good fight. And she fought that cancer for several years and she never whined and she never complained. And she even brought people to Christ while she fought cancer. And she may not be able to remember a single sermon, but she would tell you that those years of faithfully hearing the word of the Lord gave her an unconquerable hope. And that's why I think preaching matters. So, I'm going to close with three real quick observations. Here's number one. We cannot always be brilliant, but we can always be prepared. I gave my elders a promise the day they hired me 32 years ago. I will never step into a pulpit and wing it. I've kept that promise. We can't be brilliant week after week after week. But we can go up with our loaves and fishes and know we were prepared. It is, it is pastorally, not just incompetent, but it's, what's my word? It's inexcusable to have the privilege of feeding the flock of God and you don't have a milk prepared. Number two. There's great value over the long haul in getting on base every week. I don't hit many home runs. Not many of us do. But I hit a lot of singles. And there's great value in your people trusting this week if I go to church, there'll be a base hit. And number three, good preaching is the best way to bless every other ministry in the church best thing I can do for the youth ministry, the student ministry, the missions ministry, any other ministry in my church, the best thing I can do for any of them is week after week be faithful with loads and fishes and anointed by the Spirit of God. And so, having said all that, my final word is preach, brother. Preach. Thank you for your time. All right. Well, I hope if you preached, you were encouraged. I hope if you don't, that you're serving King Jesus some way, somehow, and that you were likewise encouraged and found something applicable in Rick's message. Thanks again for joining us as we kick off this fourth season of our podcast. We'll see you next time for another Renew.org Network podcast.